2 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, if you uh, don't have a Bible, if you uh, didn't bring one, uh, there should be one in the seat near you. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there's some paperbacks in there. You're welcome to take one of those. That is our gift to you. I would love you to have that and use that and read that and uh, benefit by it. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We help us not to take your word lightly. The fact that you have spoken to us is such a treasure. The fact that you have not left us to guess, to figure out for ourselves how we can enter into your presence, how we can be accepted by you. Thank you that you, you are a God who communicates with us. Thank you that you are a God who speaks to us. Thank you that you are a God who, who loves us and demonstrates your love by communicating with us, by speaking to us. So Lord, we ask now as we open your word together that you would be with us, that you would help us. Give us, give us ears to hear you. To hear your voice. You said that your sheep hear your voice. And you know us and we follow you. Lord, we, we want to follow you today. We want to. We want to hear the voice of our shepherd. And just enjoy spending time in your presence. <coughs> Hearing from our king. Enjoying the presence of our King, being taught by our King. Lord, we, we want now to just sit at your feet and let the distractions, the cares of the world just fade away. And we want to hear from you. We want to enjoy your presence today. So be at work in us by your Holy Spirit. Speak to us. We surrender to you and ask that you would do your work in us for your glory. For the sake of your great name, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Second Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Paul begins 2 Corinthians in chapter 1 by pointing us to the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. If we are afflicted, Paul says, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort. He points us to a God who brings comfort out of affliction. <coughs> and here in chapter 2, he points us to a God who can even bring joy out of sorrow or pain. A painful relationship. This passage uses the language of pain or sorrow or grief. In all of Paul's letters, he uses the noun and the verb form of this word sorrow 24 times. 18 of the 24, a full three quarters, are right here in 2 Corinthians. <coughs> 
and 16 of those 18 show up between the first verses of chapter 2 and where he picks this narrative back up in the beginning of chapter 7. Almost three quarters of his use of this word sorrow or pain is in this narrative section between chapter 2 and chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians. In chapter 2, he uses the word grief or sorrow or pain eight times. When he picks up back in chapter 7, he uses it another eight times. He also uses words around that like affliction, anguish of heart, tears. Some have said if Philippians is known for the predominance of the word joy, in the letter, 2 Corinthians should be known for the predominance of the word pain. The Corinthians were his problem children, writes one commentator on 2 Corinthians. Indeed, the letter to the church in Philippi is characterized by joy. But when I looked, the words joy or rejoice show up 14 times in Philippians. <laughs> They show up 13 times in 2 Corinthians. <coughs> the next closest concentration of joy is six times, less than half, in 1 Thessalonians. Although 2 Corinthians is a letter characterized by sorrow, there is a real tension between sorrow and joy. There is an interplay between sorrow and joy. Joy. At the end of chapter 1, Paul made it clear that he is not attempting to lord it over their faith. Rather, he is pursuing their joy. He is laboring alongside them for their <clears throat> eternal happiness. Paul is working for their joy. And there is a tug of war going on in these verses and in his heart between joy and sorrow. Last time we saw that God actually commands our joy in Him. Rejoice in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. We saw that Christianity is not a religion of duty, but a relationship of delight, <laughs> mutual delight. God delighting in us, our responding to Him with delight. We can rejoice in God Himself with deep, unquenchable joy because God Himself is full of joy. But this doesn't stop with our vertical relationship with God. It extends horizontally to our relationships with other people. And that's where it gets really messy. <laughs> right? Right. You guys understand what I'm talking about. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 1. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Paul is working with them for their joy. He is pursuing their eternal joy. He is making his travel plans with joy, their joy in his mind. His last emergency visit to Corinth was a painful one for him. If he visited again now, the visit would be painful for them. Instead, he wrote a painful letter, but not to cause them pain but to change their hearts so that when he did visit, it would be an occasion of rejoicing. Paul is pursuing their joy, 
And he is saying in this passage that his joy is all intertwined and wrapped up in their joy. And that their joy ought to be interconnected with his joy. 2 Corinthians 2, 2. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? I wrote as I did so that when I came I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. I caused you pain. You should make me glad. I might suffer pain from you. You are my joy. My joy should be your joy. There's this interconnection of joy and pain in the relationship between Paul and his church horizontal relationship. Now last time we looked at the unquenchable joy that we have in Jesus. Jesus' own joy that he gives to us that no one can take from us. Now here is Paul saying that his joy is dependent on someone else, on, so, on the Corinthian church, that his joy is circumstantial, how do these go together? We have unquenchable joy in Jesus. Jesus' own joy in us that no one can take from us. And yet Paul here says that, uh, yeah, you can cause me pain and I can cause you joy and you can bring me joy. And there's this interplay between the horizontal relationship. How does that work? This is not the only place Paul talks like this. We're going to take a minute to look around at some of the other things that he says that touch on this subject of this horizontal joy in other believers. So that we can get a picture of what, what's happening here, how this is working. In Philippians chapter 4 and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he calls his readers, he addresses his readers as you are my joy. You are my crown of boasting. You are our glory and joy. That's what he says to his readers in Philippians and 1 Thessalonians. Philippians 4 verse 1. Therefore my brothers whom I love and long for my joy. My crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. <clears throat> Do you hear his heart in those verses? Do you hear his heart of tender affection toward them? My brothers, I love, I long for you. You're my <coughs> joy, my beloved. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19, for what is our hope? or joy, or crown of boasting before the Lord. He says, when I come into the presence of Almighty God, what's my hope? We should answer, Jesus is your only hope. What's your joy when you come into the presence of Almighty God? Jesus is your only joy. That's not what Paul says here. And those are right answers. But he says here, what is our hope, our joy, our crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. What's going on here? I thought your, your hope, your joy was in Jesus alone. Now you're saying these churches are your joy. Philippians 2, he actually asks this church to complete his joy, to fill up his joy as if it were incomplete or lacking without their contribution. He says this, Philippians 2, verse 2, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. The unity of the believers. 
their Christ-like, others-focused, sacrificial humility and love, he says, fills up and completes his joy, the joy of the apostle. Complete my joy. Be of the same mind. Have the same love. Be in full accord. Be of one mind. That completes my joy. The little tiny book of Philemon, written about a runaway slave to the master of the slave. <coughs> Awkward relational thing going on there. You've got a brother in Christ who is the slave master and you run across in a different city, this runaway slave. He comes to faith in Christ, and now you're like, yeah, you need to go back to your master. And so he, sends, he writes this letter to the slave master to send with this slave that was once worthless, who is now of great value to his master because he's a fellow believer. And that, how does that relationship work? I'm your master, you're my servant, but... We're brothers, and awkward. He says in Philemon, uh, verse 7, there's only one chapter there. He says to this slave master, For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother. Because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. See what's going on there? Paul, Paul the Apostle, different city, is saying, I, I derive much joy, much comfort from you. From your love. Because you are refreshing the hearts of the saints. Springing out of his love for Christ, Philemon's love overflows to refresh the hearts of the brothers and sisters. And Paul, hearing of this outworking of the gospel in the life of a brother, brings him joy, brings him comfort. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, I think we see something like what Paul longed for, what Paul was laboring for with the Corinthian church. We see that what it should look like in the Thessalonian church. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. <laughs> but now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you, for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God. Do you hear what he says there? The good news of their faith and their love brings the apostle great joy. The gospel has taken root in that church. And they are standing firm in it. They are believing. The gospel has taken root in that church. And it was producing the fruit of love among them. Their belief in the gospel had created warm affections for the one who came and preached to them. And they longed to see him again, as he longed to see them again. There was mutual affection. There was mutual joy. Paul says, now I'm in the midst of distress, I'm in the midst of affliction. Says, now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. He says, the fact that you're standing in Jesus, the fact that you're believing and producing fruit in Jesus, that causes me to live in the midst of trouble. We see this triangular relationship going on in this passage. 
we have Paul loving Jesus, finding his joy in Jesus. And that love and joy in Jesus overflows horizontally, and he preaches the gospel. He brings good news to the Thessalonian church so that they can find love and joy in Jesus in a relationship with Jesus. And as Paul looks and sees the Thessalonians finding their love and joy in Jesus, it brings him joy. And as they look at their apostle enjoying Jesus and finding comfort in them, it brings them joy. There's this interplay between our joy in Jesus and another's joy in Jesus, which brings us that horizontal joy. He finds joy in their joy, and his joy is their joy. That's what he's talking about here in 2 Corinthians. But Paul is not the only one who talks like this. John, the Apostle John, also makes it clear what brings him joy. In the little tiny letter of 2 John, 3 John, there's 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. That's how the, the Bible ends. Uh, 2 John chapter 1, verse 4 I rejoiced greatly. <clears throat> Hear that? The, the words of joy. I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And then in verse 12, Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. I've got a relationship, and the relationship fills up, completes my joy. My joy overflows when I find you walking in the truth. 3 John, verse 3, I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth. And indeed, you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. His greatest joy, this is the Apostle John now. His greatest joy is to see other believers enjoying Jesus, walking with Jesus, walking in the truth. He says it most clearly in 1 John. 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 3. He says, That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, So that you too may have fellowship with us. There's that horizontal. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. There's the vertical. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. We, the apostles, proclaim what we have seen and heard, the gospel about Jesus Christ, so that you may enter into this fellowship with the Father and with the Son. As we have a reconciled relationship with God and enjoy intimacy with Jesus through the gospel, when you believe the gospel, you also enter into that reconciled, joy-filled relationship and fellowship with God. And when you enter into that relationship, when I see you enjoying Jesus, it brings me joy. It brings my joy to fulfillment, to completion. There's a vertical fellowship with God. There's a horizontal fellowship with other believers. When that triangle is complete, when I'm enjoying God and you're enjoying God and I'm seeing you enjoying God and you're seeing me enjoying God, our joy is full. Our joy is complete. C.S. Lewis <coughs> writes, It is frustrating to come suddenly at the turn of the road upon some mountain valley of unexpected grandeur. 
then to have to keep silent because the people with you care for it no more than for a tin can in the ditch. Have you ever had that experience? Oh, this is... I have to tell someone. That's just natural. I have to show someone. This is awesome. Our joy is not complete until it is shared. That's, what, that's what's going on here is... Okay, the mountain valley grandeur, that's great, but have you met Jesus? That's nothing. Have you met Jesus? Do you know the Father? Do you know the Father's love? Ain't nothing better. I gotta share it with somebody. You need, you, this is, my sins are all gone. I'm a wreck. Do you know my heart? I'm a mess. He forgave it all. And he wants to forgive. This is awesome. Come, check this out. I'm not happy until you see it too. There's what's going on here. There's this, yes, I'm, I'm enjoying God, but I need you to know. I need you to enjoy this with me. Our joy is fulfilled when it is shared. This shared joy is the joy of the triune God. Last time we said we can enjoy God because God is joy. And for God's joy to be full, it must be joy in another, joy shared with another. And yet, for His joy to not be idolatrous joy, God's joy must be in God. The Father delights in His only Son. This is, you hear that, right? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. And Jesus says, this is my Father. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for He is the one God. Worship Him. The Father delights in His only Son. The Son delights in the Father. The Spirit delights in the Father and the Son. And the Son delights in the Spirit's delighting in the Father. And so on. You have this mutual joy and delighting, this shared. This, do you know, this is awesome. Together, this shared experience of joy. And it is complete. This joy is joy in relationship, a shared joy. Paul has pointed to this shared joy already back in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 with the metaphor of the church as the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, he says... For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. So he's picturing, picturing a physical human body. You got eyeballs, you got earlobes, you got nostrils, you got big toes, you got kneecaps, shoulder blades, but it's one body. It's one thing. One unit, one unified whole. So it is with the body of Christ, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many and he goes on in verse 24, God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And then in verse 26 he says, if 
one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. <clears throat> the picture he's painting, the members of the body are meant to be unified, to care for one another, because we are part of the body. When one member is pained, the whole body hurts. When one member experiences joy, the whole body rejoices together. This is God's design. God has so composed the body. Paul is working for the joy of the Corinthian church and for our joy because they are connected. Their joy is his joy. His joy is their joy because they're connected. Listen to Paul's confidence in verse 3. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. Paul is confidently pursuing their joy, even, even in bringing them pain, because he is persuaded that when his children are walking in the truth, he can rejoice and this will also bring to them the greatest joy. Paul has a theological confidence in the way God has designed the body that frees him to seek their greatest good, even when it causes him personal pain, because he knows that pursuing their joy will bring him the most joy in the end. Now, I believe Paul would have been very tempted to come to Corinth. He says, I did not come in order to spare you. I think Paul in his flesh would say, I am there and it is not going to be pretty. But I'm going to clear my name. I'm going to defend my honor. I'm going to set things right because I have been defamed and I ain't having it. Instead, Paul chooses the way of the cross. He chose to be wronged rather than to demand his own way, to demand that his name be cleared. He chose to spare them, to extend mercy to them, to give them time to repent. And he himself bore the pain. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Paul had mentioned in chapter 1 his affliction in Asia. The affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Now he says that he wrote out of much affliction and anguish of heart. Later in chapter 7, he mentions verse 5, For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without, and fear within. He may be talking here about his fears within. Much affliction, anguish of heart, heaped on top of the burden beyond strength, despairing of life itself. Anyone who has experienced Relational conflict and tension understands the soul-sapping fatigue of being emotionally spent. Paul writes through his tears. Not to cause pain, but out of pain. 
He writes here to open his heart to them. And in verse 4, the word order is emphatic. In the original, it reads, But the love, in order that you might know that I have abundantly to you, Paul has to let him know right up front that it is love, not in order to grieve, but the love. Love, love, it's love. It's not grieve, it's love. Puts that word right at the, the front of the sentence. You just can't not say it right up front. Paul did not write to hurt them, to spite them, because he was angry with them. It was love. He doesn't even directly say that they hurt him, although I think we can piece that together pretty clearly from what was going on. He says, I write out of affliction and anguish of heart, but he doesn't blame. He doesn't say, oh man, you guys really hurt me. Instead, he seeks to avoid causing them unnecessary sorrow. He wants to spare them because he loves them. His decision-making, his life, his ministry is modeled after the cross. Because Jesus doesn't say, Wow, look how much you hurt me. Look how terrible you are. No, Jesus says, I want you to know how abundantly much I love you. I want you to experience joy. I want a relationship with you. Paul here is just modeling his life and ministry after his Lord, after the cross, the way of the cross. Hebrews 12 says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. <coughs> See, Paul modeled his life, his ministry after Jesus, after the cross. It's not about me, it's not about my rights, it's not about me clearing my name or vindicating my honor. I want to serve you because I love you. I want to pursue your joy because I know that when you, your joy is in Jesus and your joy is full, then my joy in you will be full. What an amazing thing. We worship a God who brings comfort to us in all our affliction. And, with, and this is a God who can even bring joy to us through the pain of relationships. God is working with us for our multiplied joy. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth, the beauty of your word. Thank you for speaking to us. And thank you that you are a God who pursues us and pursues our joy. You're a God who delights in us and delights when we delight in you. Lord, wean us away from the things that that do not satisfy, the things that distract us from you. Lord, help us to be serious about our joy, to pursue our joy in you, to get our souls happy in God every day. 
And Lord, help us to pursue our joy in the joy of one another. Help us encourage one another every day, as long as it is called today, to find joy in you, to find happiness in you, to find contentment in you. Lord, help us to be content with the good things you give us. God, give us a glimpse of your glory. Lord, we are wowed by so many things of this world. Give us that vision of your glory that, that we just can't contain. Your gospel is so great. Your love is so awesome. Your mercy is so rich. Your kindness is so sweet. And the cross is so beautiful. We can't keep it to ourselves. And give us a vision of you. And may that just fill our hearts to overflowing so that we can not not share our joy in you with everyone.